your hymn books, if you would, number 705. 705, this is a good summer song. When you're going about your way, take the name of Jesus with you. Number 705, let's stand together, please, as we sing this. 705. announcements to make you aware of. We appreciate those who've responded for willingness to be able to sponsor, sponsor some young people, teenagers or children for camp, and uh, we appreciate you being willing to do that. Uh, so there's a lot of camps that are going on uh, this week. I believe there's a, a teen camp that's coming up at Wincrest Senior High, uh, and then there's family camp at Forest Glen Bible Camp. So a lot of camps that are going on, so we may be praying about that. And um, Vacation Bible School needs, we have our, uh, our focus for Vacation Bible School is uh, kids under construction. So we're kind of collecting some things or some items posted on the board back there to make you aware of. And so uh, those are just some things to, to take note of. And we'll be collecting also cookies uh, and juice boxes for our Vacation Bible School. So uh, if you wouldn't mind bringing those, put them down in the kitchen. You put the juice boxes in the fridge, that would be great. Okay, let's pray, and then we'll worship the Lord while we listen to this hymn. Father, thank you for the blessings that we have. Uh, we have so many, uh, several good Christian camps that are within driving distance, and I pray that you would uh, work in the hearts of the campers as the gospel and the word of God is preached. We thank you for the blessings of uh, the opportunity to serve you through our community at the Vacation Bible School and the teen rally that we're having in August and uh, that we'd be able to collect cookies and Kool-Aid for that and uh, uh, some juice boxes. And I just pray that you would help us to take the name of Jesus with us this week, and that we would live for you with courage, share our faith, tell people about Jesus, that Jesus saves. We pray that you would accept our gifts of giving, those who've given online or in the, the box in the back. As we listen to this hymn, we remember that that's an act of worship. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Corinthians. Take your hymn books, if you would, number 212. Jesus is coming back someday, some glorious morning. Sorrows will cease. He'll shout the victory and break through the blues. Some golden day break for me and for you. 212. Let's stand together one more time, if you would. 212. Oh, 
rock of ages cleft for even me. I'm sheltered there for all eternity. Oh, love divine, is love is mine. Oh, rock of ages cleft for even me. Though human love may fail and oft grow cold, I know a love that will forever hold. It's tried and true, it's old yet new. It's in the rock of ages cleft for me. Oh, rock of ages cleft for even me. I'm sheltered there for all eternity. Oh, love divine, his love is mine. Oh, rock of ages cleft for even me. Bibles, if you would please, and turn to the book of 1 Kings chapter 8, if you would. 1 Kings chapter 8. It was a blessing this, this summer to be able to take our trip to Israel, to be able to go with family, and we had the opportunity to go and, and see, there, there was a lot of things that were a blessing, a lot of places to be in Galilee, to be on the Sea of Galilee where Jesus and the disciples would have been. The disciples would have grown up being fishermen with their fathers and then Jesus walking on the water in the Sea of Galilee to be in Capernaum and see the foundation of the synagogue where Jesus would have based his ministry out of and taught to be in Magdala where Mary Magdalene was from was a very special place for me, one of my favorite places, really, uh, in, around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and then when we went to Bethlehem and then Jerusalem, to be able to spend several days in Jerusalem in the evenings, to be able to go for a walk there. And uh, one of the first evenings in Jerusalem, even though our tour had ended at 6.30 at supper time, uh, I just felt like, you know, we got to get our money's worth. Uh, so my brother, Jeremy, had already been in the, the Israel before, and so he, he said, I, let's go, let's go for a walk. I know, I know how to get to around in Jerusalem, so we got a map, of course, from the, uh, from the front desk at the hotel, and uh, my dad and my two brothers and I went for an evening walk in Jerusalem. Uh, we, while we were there, uh, the sun was going down, so the city lights were coming on, we walked from our hotel up the street and then went in the Jaffa Gate. It's one of the main, one of the main entrances into the old city, what they call the old city of Jerusalem. And as we were walking there, we came across some marketplaces. Um, and as we were w walking in the marketplace, there's all kinds of trinkets that they could sell for you. We noticed one of these marketplaces. Not only, most of them would sell scarves, they would sell hats with the Star of David or, or flags of Israel on it, or uh, you could get t-shirts from Jerusalem. And, um, but one of the things we found interesting is they, they really, I don't know why, they must have a family member in Alabama because here was this whole store that was called Alabama, the heart of Dixie, right in the middle of old Jerusalem. And it's very, um, I don't know, you could say uh, very market-driven uh, in some of the way that they do some of these. And my brother actually pastors in Alabama now at Huntsville at the Calvary Baptist Church. And so we just had to stop and get this particular picture. You know that the, the men actually have uh, kippahs or yarmulks that they wear on the top of their heads. It's a sign of submission to the Lord, they think, in Judaism today. But it's interesting, uh, if you go on the Temple Mount, if you, if you go to the Wailing Wall, excuse me, if you go to the Western Wall to go past 
to go up to the area where they're praying at the Western Wall. And they pray there because it's the closest you can get to the Temple Mount and pray. When you go up on the Temple Mount, you're not allowed to pray. There's Islam, there's a mosque that's up there. The Dome of the Rock is a shrine that is over supposedly the stone where Abraham offered Isaac up. But they believe Abraham offered Ishmael. But it, that's what the Quran that teaches in the confusion of, of Islam. But you're, you're not allowed to pray. You're not allowed to read scripture on the Temple Mount or the soldiers and the Muslims that are watching everyone will come and stop you and you could start a riot. It has many times. And so the closest place they can pray to where the temple used to stand is on that western wall. And if you go to that western wall, you're supposed to go over. They have a little container there where the men are supposed to pick up and put the yarmulk on. And, uh, and our guide told us that we could keep, we could keep them uh, as a souvenir. And uh, I, I did see quite a few people putting them back. So I, I guess they get used and rotated quite a bit there at the, at the, the praying wall. But, they have, but in the gift shops, they can be um, lots of designs on them. Here's a design of some. One has the Star of David on and some Hebrew writing. One has um, a lion of the tribe of Judah on there and the Star of David on there. I did find this one interesting. Uh, I, I do not know. Apparently, this particular shop liked President Trump. Now, he was the president that finally moved the embassy from, uh, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And so they're thankful for that in, in Israel. I'll show you some pictures of that on another day. Uh, we did get pictures at the U.S. Embassy uh, in Jerusalem. But I did find this a very strange y'all mark. I don't know that I would want to be wearing any president on my head. Um, and uh, anyway, I thought that was very interesting. This is a marketplace. This is very interesting. You understand when you're walking the old city of Jerusalem, if you go there today, you're about one to two stories above where Jesus walked. There's rubble and there's tunnels underground. So you're walking on the streets in this marketplace. You're walking about one to two stories above the Roman roads during Jesus' day. But when you come into a particular area in the marketplace, there are stairs that go down one to two flights to a little landing area that they've dug out, they've excavated it, and they found these pillars to the old marketplace in Jesus' day. So this is during the daytime, and what they have is, they haven't dug out the whole thing, because you'd have to dig up half the city or the whole city to find where Jesus' day is. But they've dug out a little square section, and at the end where they stopped digging is a wall. And on that wall, they have painted a huge painting, this mural, of what the market would have looked like in Jesus' day. So you're, you're, you're standing in the columns yourself, and then you're looking at this 3D picture of what it would have been like to go to the market in Jesus' day. It's very interesting. Now, uh, I, we found this at night. We went at the nighttime, and it was beautiful. It, we went at night. My brother said, look, let's go down these steps. Those are stones Jesus would have walked on. It's the marketplace where the disciples would have been. Every time, three times a year, Jesus went to Jerusalem. These are the markets that he would have been at. And so it was, it was very uh, just kind of awe-inspiring and encouraging to be able to be at a place in the same town and then actually to walk on the Roman roads. They're built quite well and to be able to see that. What I did not notice when we went in the daytime a few days later with our guide was this painting has an interesting feature to it. It has the painting of a little boy in today's world with a ball cap and a backpack on receiving a gift from a little Jewish girl in the marketplace. And it's kind of a tourist trap because you can go stand in front of that little boy's painting with the backpack and the ball cap on and hold your hand out and it looks like she's giving you the gift. So there's my brother, Jared. He's pastor at First Baptist in LaSalle, Illinois. And he is holding his hand out. And he, he's standing in front of the painting of the boy, but it looks in the picture like she from the past is handing him something now in the present. So it was an ingenious little thing in the marketplace there, and I just thought I would share some of those things. This is Jerusalem in Jesus' day. Jerusalem in Jesus' day. This would have been a view probably from somewhere in the upper room where Jesus had communion with his disciples. 
where Jesus ate the Passover with his disciples and instituted what we're going to do tonight when we pass around these plates and remember the body and the blood of Jesus. We're going to read that text just before we do that tonight. But this is probably the view. You understand that the Temple Mount is up on a hill, and on one side is a valley. That's the Kidron Valley, and then there's another hill opposite that of the uh, Mount of Olives, okay? So the temple is on a little hill, like Lutz Mountain Hill, okay? So on one side is the, 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 the Kidron Valley. On the other side was a, another valley. But the whole city is built on this valley. So what Hezekiah did is he kind of brought some fill in to try and fill up that middle valley. So really you have a hill that the temple is on and a hill that the other city is built on. And then there's some fill. They kind of tried to level it out a little bit. And then even in Herod's day, he's going to fill it in a little bit more. So you have the city is kind of flat. It's hilly, okay, in the old city. But it is a little higher on this side, so you could look over from one side of the city. And the temple, you understand the temple itself was, was, was about three stories high. It was quite tall. You could see it from many places in the city when you weren't down inside the marketplace in between the walls. This is Jerusalem today, okay? So here's the Temple Mount over on your right. And this is the western wall of the Temple Mount, okay? We'll talk a little bit about how the city's divided today, but this is the western wall. This is the southern wall, and that's what we're gonna focus on tonight, the Temple Steps. Okay, so here's the western wall. That's what you see on the news. I'm, I think you can Google the western wall, and you can see a live camera of what's going on in, at the western wall at any particular time. But here is the southern wall, okay? This is a southern wall. Do you realize that the city of David, you remember David conquered Jerusalem with Joab? David conquered, that is south of the Temple Mount. It's not even on this map, okay? This is a map of Jerusalem proper. The old city of David is just some houses and archeological digs. There's not much there but a museum now. It's a smaller hill to the south. So the temple steps, would have been facing in Solomon's day, you're in 1 Kings 8. In 1 Kings 8, these temple step direction would have been facing where Solomon's palace would have been, where David's palace would have been, where old Jerusalem in David's day would have been. And you understand Hezekiah built up what you see now. Everything to the west of the Temple Mount, Hezekiah built up, and then Herod built further north. So it just kind of kept expanding. But these southern steps are very important in Jesus' day and in Solomon's day. Look at 1 Kings chapter 8, if you would. Solomon has built the temple. Verse number 1, it says in 1 Kings 8, Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all of the heads of the tribes and the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel unto King Solomon in Jerusalem that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves into King Solomon at the feast in the month Ithanim, which is the seventh month. All of the elders of Israel came and the priests took up the ark and they brought the ark of the Lord and the tabernacle of the congregation, all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle, even those did the priests and the Levites bring up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen and could not be told, nor numbered for a multitude. Look at verse number 10. And it came to pass... When the priests were come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Now the rest of this chapter is going to be Solomon's dedication prayer to this building. He's going to have a pulpit built, not to preach as much as it is to pray. So the pulpit would have been bigger than the one here. 
this is built for preaching in the Word of God. His pulpit that he built would have been built to pray on. So he would have had steps up to it, and it would have been almost like a, a mini platform of wood that he is going to pray to the Lord. And he's going to pray 1 Kings chapter 8. He's going to say in verse 22, And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation and spread forth his hands toward heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or in earth beneath who keepest covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart. And he goes on to talk about David and the covenant that God made with David. Verse 29, that thine eyes may be open toward this house night and day and toward the place of which thou hast said, my name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. This is a picture of the western wall in Jerusalem that we took while we were there. It is full. On another time, I'll share with you and we'll share some passages about the walls of Jerusalem and prophecy. I was able to go to the Temple Institute and see the new, um, the new art articles and furniture that they have built for the next temple. Uh, they are just about ready, and I have some pictures I'd like to show you. Uh, but this is a picture of the Western Wall. The day that we were there, just to give a short commercial, it was graduation day for the military. So they were there by the thousands in their military uniforms and their units with their weapons that were loaded. <laughs> and they put their hands on their guns and swore allegiance to protect Jerusalem and Israel at their graduation ceremony. It was very full. That's the Western Wall. This is the Southern Wall. Not a lot going on. Not a lot of prayers happening here. But this is the southern wall. This was not in our tour agenda. This was our last day. We had the afternoon free, and we kind of looked at each other. We've, we've had a great time in Jerusalem. This is our last night. Where do you want to go? And we kind of talked, and we said, well, we haven't had time to go to the Holocaust Museum. Do we want to go to the Holocaust Museum? Well, we haven't been to Hezekiah's Tunnel. Do you want to go to Hezekiah's Tunnel? I have some pictures of Hezekiah's Wall we'll look at later. But I, my vote, I said, look, whatever we do, at some point, I want to go to the temple steps. These are the steps that would have been during Herod's day, during Jesus' day. These are the steps that Jesus and his disciples would have went up. As a matter of fact, there's going to be a couple of places on these steps that their stone, they were brought in and put there. But several of these steps were actually carved into the mountain. Remember Pilate's steps? We looked at those last week. Pilate's steps were actually carved out of the mountain that went up to his apartment. Some of these, you can see the step, and then the next step down is bedrock, back in Abraham's day stuff, all right, since creation and the flood. So this is where I wanted to go. I wanted to go to the front temple steps where the pilgrims coming to Passover would have come in and gone out. Said, I want to stand right there. Because if you're in Jerusalem, you can go down to that little square in the middle of the marketplace, go down two stories and see the pillars. That's neat. But I know Jesus went in the temple a lot. When he was 12 years old, you remember that? Jesus' first chance to go not only up these steps into the temple, He'd been going as a little boy into the court of the Jewish women and children. Twelve years old, now he's old enough to go with the men closer to the temple itself for the first time, the court of the men. As a matter of fact, there was a, a short wall that was there just before you went in. You went up these steps into the temple walls, the support wall here, and then up more steps to the temple precinct area, okay? And in that precinct area, it's several acres up there. It's huge when you get up there, this huge flat section that Herod expanded from Solomon's day. And when you get up there, they had all of these pillars and, and shaded areas all around the temple where you could have Bible studies 
and you could ask questions of the rabbis about the scriptures and you could talk about theology and the things of the Lord. That's what you were supposed to do and pray. But anybody could go in that area. It's a huge, huge area. I think somebody said, uh, I have to check the charts, but I said it around, somewhere around 10 acres up there to 14 acres. Huge area up there. So when you get up there, you would go and you would come to the court of the Gentiles and there was a wall. And the wall, some people say, was about four feet high. In the wall, there was a sign that basically said, Gentiles forbidden beyond this point, basically at your own risk. So your, your, your life is on your own head if you take, go past this and you're not a Jew. Jesus would have gone past that with his mother, okay, and his brothers and sisters until his 12th birthday. You remember when they went home and they realized, Jesus isn't with you? No, I thought he was with you. Well, he's 12 years old. I thought he was with the men now. He wasn't with us and the kids, so I thought he was traveling with the men this time. No, I thought he was still with you because it's his last year. He could do either or. I didn't know. So they went back. Finally, after three days, they found him. You remember where he was? In the temple. Jesus' ministry would have been up and down these steps. This was a very special moment. I'm, we can talk later about Calvary and where Jesus was buried. There's two sites that Christians think it could be. Either way, it's still around the city of Jerusalem. It really doesn't matter. We know Jesus died and rose from the grave, and no matter what tomb you find that's empty, it's got to be empty if it's Jesus's. There's a neat little trick that they have if you go to the temple steps today. Do you know if you go in some of the lighthouses and around the Maritimes, if you want to see a long way away, they had these old uh, telescopes. You can kind of put uh, some uh, tuning in or a loony in and put your quarters in, and you can put it in, and it'll let you see a long way, and it kind of lets you do that. They have those on the temple steps for free. But you look into them, and you're still seeing through to the temple actual steps. But they have a little cartoon sketch. So on the left, you're seeing the temple steps. On your right, you don't realize it. You're looking at the same steps. They just have put a couple of outlines of what it would have looked like in Jesus' day. So you're still seeing the same section. So I took a picture, and then I put my camera up to this little, little globe that you look through, and it's still see-through. I could see my brothers on the other side going up and down the steps. But it has a little cartoon sketch of what would it look like in Jesus' day. This is from the left side. This is from the bottom steps going up to the temple. So on the right side is the actual steps I'm looking at going up to the temple. On the left, I just put my camera right over the little tube that had the cartoon picture, but you're still looking at the same steps. The one on the left is what it would have looked like in Jesus' day in the steps of the temple. And I just stood there to think 2,000 years ago at Passover, there would have been people coming and going. I want to show you another view here. This is a sketch of what they think these steps would have looked like in Jesus' day. Three gates on the right, two gates on the left. Do you know how when you go into Halifax at rush hour, if you go to Halifax now, they have this huge bridge going to Dartmouth. And depending on what, if it's in the morning or at night, they have signs that you have to look at, and some of them are red X's. That means don't go in that lane. You're going the opposite direction. And some of them are green. So in the morning time, when everybody's going into Halifax from Dartmouth, they'll have the green, more green lights. Let's say they'll have four lanes going into Halifax, but only two lanes leaving Halifax. But in the evening, they'll change it. So you got to look at the lights to see, okay, at this time of day, there's more people going out of Halifax to Dartmouth, so we're going to make this three to four lanes going out of Halifax and only two lanes coming in, all right? Same idea with the temple. The three gates on the right are going into the temple. The two gates on the left are coming out of the temple, okay? Get that picture in your mind? We want lots of people going in, and they're going to be in a mob, I believe it was Alfred Edersheim made the comment that up on the temple precinct, you could get about over 200,000 people up on the temple mount. So a lot of worshipers there, 200,000 worshipers up on the temple mount. So a lot of people going up. 
and these two gates for people coming out. Now, unless you were grieving. If you were grieving, you remember the Apostle Paul when he shaved his head and took a Nazarite vow? He took a vow before the Lord. Okay, he did it twice, once in the middle of his ministry and then at the end of the ministry just before he was arrested. You remember he went with the Jews and Pastor James said, would you help these Nazarites complete their vow and go to the temple? Paul said, yeah, sure. I, I, don't, I love Jews. I can still go to the temple even though I'm a New Testament Christian. Remember Paul went there and they started a riot saying, oh, he brought a Gentile into the temple area. He didn't, but you remember that, okay? It's probable that Paul would have went in backwards. Because if you're in mourning, the way you expressed it was you didn't go in with everybody else. You would go in the out gate. And that would show, okay, these people are grieving right now. They have a loss or they're mourning. They're coming to worship and they've got something we need to pray for them about. That's kind of the way the culture had fleshed out these gates that are there. This is what it possibly would have looked like. You see that little porch there? Do you know what's underneath that porch? What would have been underneath that porch in this picture on the temple steps would have been, we call it as Baptists, we call it baptismals. And the Jews would call them mikvahs. Because when you came from Jerusalem to go worship the Lord from Galilee, you were unclean. I mean, you're up there at Galilee. You've got Tiberius and Capernaum, and there's a lot of Romans up there in Nazareth. Yeah, you, you're going to come worship. You've got to take a bath first before you go in the temple. Sometimes you were, if you touched a dead body, you were unclean for seven days, and then you had to come to these baths, take a ritual cleansing bath that said, my heart is clean, my body is clean. Before I go up to worship, I'm going to come take a bath in this mikvah. They had little, like little changing rooms underneath there where you would go and you would dip into the water. You didn't get sprinkled you would immerse yourself and say, okay, I've had my ritual bath. You didn't need soap, because it wasn't about being physically clean. It was just a ritual to say, I want to be clean before God from any taint of sin. So here I am with two of the outdoors. You remember I said the three gates go in, two gates go out. This is a good picture of Israel today. These, you can only see half of one of these gates. Why? Because the Muslims came in and they built up a fort wall all the way up to the Temple Mount and they bricked in the doors. Don't want anybody. Matter of fact, if you were to able to break through these entrances and exits, what you'd find on the other side is a, uh, is a mosque. Now, they used to allow tourists to be able to go down those steps and see the other side of the wall, but they won't let you do that now because unfortunately... It was a, uh, a radical that went in there and started a riot. We won't talk about that. But this is half of a gate, and it's a good picture of they're not under God's blessing today. Israel is not saved, not yet. But half this gate is walled in. This would have been where Jesus and the disciples would have exited when they came out. It's very interesting and encouraging. Here is a mikvah, purification bath. Now, we were there at the end of the day. They had closed down the museum. They had 20 minutes left. We said, please, please. And I don't know if it was my brother's smile or the way I said A or something in Canadian, um, or please, we've come so far. But they said, okay, uh, we'll let you go in. Just see yourself out, and please don't get hurt because we don't want to get in trouble. I said, okay, yes, we'll be very careful. So they had closed everything down, and we just wandered on the temple steps for an hour and a half. The sun's going down. And we wandered down and got into some of these mikvahs. Now, as you can see, there's not enough water in there to get fully immersed. And, but we just got some pictures. There's steps going down into them. This is a little picture of what they see. Now, as a Baptist, this got exciting for me. So here's the picture. They would have come down into the water. They would have come up to about chest deep or waist deep into the water. They would have... Some, dipped themselves into the water, and then gone back out, and they would be considered purified. This is a Jewish depiction of their purification baths. There's, there's all in the front of the Temple Mount. Now, they're all around the temple, but especially in the front of the Temple Mount. This is the mikmah bath. These are called the hold the gates. You remember the three ins and the two outs? The three going in are called the hold the gates. I don't remember, but here is my dad and my two brothers. These are huge gates. 
I mean, it's not a little turnstile. You can get a lot of people in at once, okay? You can get like um, six people all together in a family, arm in arm, could just walk right in the temple entranceways and then up the steps to the main temple mount. These are the southern hold gates. But you know the most moving thing for me is this is where God used to live. I mean, I'm not trying to be uh, sacrilegious, but God can be everywhere. I theologically understand that. God is omnipresent. First, uh, that's in Psalm 139. But there is a place where God said to the nation, when you get in the land, you worship in the place that I will show you. And this is it. These gates led up to the spot where God said, that's it. Now he used David. I mean, David saw the, the, the angel that was part of the plagues standing right there over the threshing floor of and, and David purchased the threshing floor, and he said, that's, that's where we're going to build the temple. And then God said, Solomon's going to build it. David said, okay, I'll save up everything. Solomon built this. The gates that I'm looking at, even though they're bricked in, would have been from Herod's day. Do you remember that in Herod's day that he took the second temple? The first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586. And then you had... Z uh, Zerubbabel and Haggai and Zechariah and you had Nehemiah and Ezra they're going to come back and they're going to rebuild the walls they're going to rebuild the temple you remember that you remember Malachi's prophecy in Malachi 3 one day my servant will suddenly come into his temple and that was Jesus friend he was the Messiah now he was the servant of God Jesus is going to come up these steps and these temples and you remember when he came in the day on Sunday, on Palm Sunday, you remember how he orchestrated all that? They're celebrating him as the Messiah. That's on Sunday. On Monday, Jesus comes back and he cleanses the temple. You remember that? He cleanses the temple. And for two days, Mark and Luke are going to say, Jesus took control of the temple mount. He would not let them carry even a box. Some people would say that people not only went into the temple to worship, but it was in the way of the Mount of Olives, so people would take a shortcut with their trade goods through the temple. There was a side entrance from the marketplace that they would come in, cut through the worship center, and go out another gate, which would have been the eastern golden gate to the Mount of Olives. They'd just take a court shortcut through the church building, you could say. Jesus wouldn't let any of that happen. So not only religious leaders got mad, but the crowd's getting kind of mad. The merchants are getting kind of mad because now they can't do business in the temple. Jesus shut it down. He says, my, my house shall be called a house of prayer. So no, this is about the presence of God. This is a very special place. And for me to think, 3,000 years ago, Solomon was dedicating this mountain to worship God. In Nehemiah's day, 2,500 years ago, Zerubbabel and Haggai and Zechariah were dedicating these steps in this temple mount to the worship of God. And to think that the presence of the Lord was there. Do you remember when it left? Do you remember when God packed up and said, I know I've been here with my glory, but I'm going back to heaven now, and my glorious presence will not be here anymore until I come back. Do you remember? What prophet told about that? Ezekiel. Ezekiel saw it. He was a captive in Babylon by the river Chebar, but he got a vision of what God was doing in Jerusalem, just above these temple steps. The glory of God over the holy place lifted up. And then it traveled over the eastern gate. And then went across the eastern gate to the Mount of Olives toward the east. And then it went back up to heaven. That's why Christmas is significant, that wise men came from where? The east. The glory of God shining past Jerusalem down to Bethlehem, showing the wise men where the glory of God is back. Jesus is going to come. And this, uh, let me go forward here. This is my grandmother. My brother Jared is on my right. My dad is on my left. This is my mother, and this is my grandmother. 
I have not seen my grandmother in years. We flew out of Atlanta, and we flew black back to Atlanta from Israel. I was able to spend a few days with my grandmother and see her house. She just moved last year. Matter of fact, at Christmas time, my sister flew down there and helped my grandmother move into her new house. Some of you have heard of the Masters Tournament in Georgia, in Augusta, Georgia. My grandmother lived in Augusta, Georgia at the end of the 13th hole in the little community there. She'd been there for years. Well, she sold her house and she moved across to South Carolina just a few minutes away. I was able to see my grandmother's new house. On Sunday after I went to church with my grandmother, this is me going to church with my grandma. After we went to church with my grandmother, we drove to where she used to live over by the Masters Club on the 13th hole, just at the end of the neighborhood there. And we not only saw her house where she used to live, we drove down the street and around the corner to where my mother used to live when she was still at home there. They moved just around the corner. My grandfather got back from the Korean War and they were, we did some moving around and so forth. That's where my grandmother lived. That was kind of special to me. Now, she doesn't live there now. That's why this temple steps were special to me. God's holy presence dwelt for over 500 years around these temple steps. If you're standing on the temple steps and you turn around and look past the baptismal sites, the mikvah, you look over the city of David, there's a street right there. You can see the buses. But I've got a little block around where the city of David would have been to the south. And all the pilgrims would have come up from David and Solomon's day, they would have come up to the temple steps. And then even in Jesus' day, they would have come from this particular direction. This is the place where prayers and praises and the preaching of the Lord would have happened. These two gates here are the out gates. You remember the three in gates? And there's a huge section of steps in between. Why did they need so many steps? Why didn't you just build a small step up to the in gate and some small steps at the out gate? Because a lot of the pilgrims... Millions of them would come and they would gather on the steps and they would talk and they would see their uncle and their grandfather coming out of the temple as they were going into the temple. And they would connect to old friends that they see three times a year as Jewish worshipers would come up to Jerusalem on these steps. They are, they're coming and going and there's so many people and this is the main thoroughfare. The rabbis in the cool of the day would gather on these steps and they would teach. They would teach on the Temple Mount under the porticos, but when those would fill up or they wanted a little breeze, they would come out those two gates, and they called this the rabbi's steps, where the rabbis would sit and they would teach their disciples. This was a place of prayers and praises and the preaching of the Word of God. But I also was reminded of something else. This is the place Peter would have preached on the day of Pentecost. In closing, go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. This is the place Acts chapter 2. Day of Pentecost. You understand? Jewish feasts the Jews were supposed to gather at Passover, the Feast of Booths, Pentecost, okay? So they're supposed to gather. If you're a Jew and you're a male, you have to come three times a year. You could bring your family if you want, but if you're a dedicated God worshiper, you're going to come to this city, to this temple, to these steps three times a year. And the city's full. Passover had happened 50 days before. Jesus has been walking around after resurrection. You remember how many days did Jesus walk around with his earthly resurrected body in Jerusalem and Galilee? Forty days. So they're in the upper room praying. And verse number one of chapter two. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, I mean, we're in the heavy swing of the fest festive circumstances here, the holiday. When the day of fully... Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all of the house where they were sitting. Where were they sitting? The upper room. Do you remember the first view of Jerusalem overlooking the whole city and over to the Temple Mount? They were in that upper room. Same upper room where they had the Lord's Supper 
for the first time the night before Jesus was crucified. They're in that upper room. They've got about 120 people crammed in that room praying for God to please send his Holy Spirit. And the house where they were sitting was full, verse number 3, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Do you see this picture? The glory and the fire of God left in Ezekiel 500 years before. Now Jesus has gone back to heaven. He's going to send his Holy Spirit to the new temple steps. See where I'm going? Instead of the fire and the glorious pillar cloud going over the temple mount, it's going over every Christian. This is, a, a, this is new. It says in verse number 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. What does that mean? That means Jews from Ethiopia, Jews from Babylon, from Persia, from Syria, from Rome, have Antioch, have all come to Jerusalem for this feast. The Bible goes on to explain. It says in verse 6, Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. Okay? It's not heavenly jibber-jabber. It's not some unknown angelic tongue that they didn't have a clue what was being said. They were languages in their own tongue. Italian, Latin, Germanic, Syrian, Syriac. They're hearing it. These Jews speak Hebrew, but from their towns where they come from, they're hearing these Galilean fishermen speak in a language, and they, it's like they grew up with that language. This is a, a, and it, you notice that it said that, um, verse number 6, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together. The disciples didn't stay in the upper room when this happened. They're going out into the marketplace. You remember the picture of the streets with the markets? That's where the disciples are going now. And they're preaching the gospel. They're not just jibber-jabbering. They're preaching the gospel. Verse number 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And now hear we every man our own tongue, wherein we were born. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and in Pontus and in Asia and in Phrygia and in Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, that's where Simon was, Simon of Cyrene, and strangers in Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So they're in the marketplaces now, and everybody's talking about it in all the marketplaces, in the middle of town, and in the temple area, okay? There's markets right in the temple area near these baths in front of the temple steps. So the disciples are going out amongst the people. Everybody's a buzz. It's a holiday. There's lots of people around. The, the steps, people going into the temple, people coming out of the temple, and Bible scholars believe Peter and the disciples make their way through the markets, right through the heart of the city, speaking the Old Testament gospel and the message of Jesus that he rose from the dead, and they're making their way to the temple steps. Because on the temple steps, you can address thousands of people, and you just walk through both major marketplaces in the city. So look what happens in verse number 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. It's only nine o'clock in the morning, guys. Okay, you, us, us eleven guys aren't drunk. It's early in the morning. No, this is of God, verse 16. But this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. Go down to verse 22. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, 
a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified. Isn't that great? Jesus had to raise from the dead. He's the son of God. He's the perfect sacrifice. For David speaketh concerning him. And he goes on to expound a long sermon. Go to verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus which you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Stop, picture this, temple steps. That's what you're looking at here in the picture. Temple steps. Some rabbis are on the steps with their disciples. There's flocks of people, five family wide, arm in arm, going in the three gates. There's people coming out the two gates. So you're right in the main thoroughfare. You've been through the two marketplaces. You're on these huge temple steps, and they're filled with people. And Peter is preaching the gospel. There are thousands of people listening. It says, verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent! I mean, isn't that what Jesus tried to tell them? Repent, the kingdom of heaven's at hand. That's what John the Baptist came preaching. You're a sinner. Ask God to forgive you. What a message. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise is unto you and to your children. And to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Peter goes on, he says, look, any of you can get saved. Any of you can repent and get right with God. The ones that are here and the ones that are not here. You can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You now become the temple steps because your body, 1 Corinthians 6 and 3, your body's now the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are the temple now. And Peter preached a long sermon, longer than me. You don't believe me? Look what it says in verse number uh, 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort. <laughs> this was a long sermon. The Holy Spirit didn't even record the whole thing. <laughs> Peter's preaching and preaching and preaching like I do sometimes. All right, verse 40. And this many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this unto word generation. And that's an old, you know, old term for a wicked generation. Then. They that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day were added to them about 3,000 souls. Some of these would have been people that 50 days before were crying, crucify him at Passover. 3,000 people get saved, and they all got baptized the same day. Now, Bible scholars who were not Baptists have been struggling with how in the world could they immerse 3,000 people in Jerusalem around the temple and the marketplace? How in the world can they dip that many people by immersion? And some, for years, we just haven't known. But they have, in the past few decades, dug, dug, and dug, and dug. And this is an archaeological dig where I was walking. These temple steps haven't always been uncovered. And now they're finding... Um, apartment buildings underground there at the, just at the temple steps. There's places to stay, and there's all of these baptismal sites all over the place. I stood in some of them. 3,000 people get saved. And he says, when you repent and call on the Lord in Jesus' name to forgive your sins, you publicly will go down into that mikvah and get immersed. But it's not because... You're trusting ritual in that temple. It's because Jesus wants to cleanse you and you're going to identify and become the new temple. And to do that in the middle of a Jewish holiday, you were boldly proclaiming, I'm a Jesus follower. I'm a Christian. Baptize me. Purify me. You, John, Bartholomew, Peter, you baptize me. Because you're one of Jesus' followers, I'm now a Jesus follower. And I'm going to go down in that room, and I'm going to let it be known 
that anybody comes in those mikvahs for the rest of the day. I mean, they got a lineup. Picture this. Three entrance gates to the temple and not many people going in. <laughs> Five entrance gates to the baptismal pools and there's a lineup down to the market now. <laughs> you see that? A reversal from the Jewish religion and their thinking that we got to go to the temple to worship God to, I've been saved. I've been forgiven by Jesus who was crucified. He's Lord in Christ. I've trusted him now. Instead of still in its long lineup to get in the temple, there's a long lineup to publicly profess the Messiah, Jesus is mine. What a change. And I, I didn't tear up in every place that I went to. But when I stood on these temple steps and I could see this baptism of sight happening, it's okay that those gates are walled up now. You know why? It's in my heart. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. He lives within my heart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within. Not the temple. This one. Isn't that a blessing? This was my favorite spot in all Jerusalem. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these scripture passages that we've seen. Thank you for this passage. Peter's great sermon that he preached. Thank you for the Word of God that, that has these little details that sometimes we don't understand. Lord, we, we don't know all of the places where you walked. We don't know every house you ever stepped inside. But it was a remembering experience being on these steps for me only because I believed the Bible and, and I knew what took place there. And even here in Moncton, New Brunswick, a month later, I rejoice over the, the Word of God that Jesus lives in my heart. The glory of God, the Holy Spirit now lives in Jason Cochran, not because I'm such a goody person, but because I'm a sinner and I repented. I trusted Jesus as my Savior. Thank you for sending the message that day of Pentecost beyond the hills of Jerusalem into Judea and all Samaria and uttermost parts of the earth all the way to Canada, North America. Thank you for the message and that strange sight that day of a lineup at the mikvahs and the empty line going into the temple. Thank you for living in our hearts because of Jesus' blood, that he died on the cross and rose from the dead for our sins. And so tonight we remember his body and his blood because Jesus died so that we can be forgiven. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you take your hymn books, if you would, please, and, and turn to number 816, if you would. It's in the back of your hymn book there. I'd ask for the men to come as we sing here in just a moment. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. If you're here tonight and you've trusted Christ as your Savior and you've been born again and you've obeyed the Lord in baptism by immersion and you, you, as far as you know, you walk with the Lord, we would invite you as we just pass the plate around, we'd welcome you to join us tonight. But as we sing this hymn, let's spend some time in prayer remembering the sacrifice of our Savior on the cross. Remembering giving his body and his blood. Let's stand together, please. Number 816, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. 